right, we are ready for the fundamental trait identities in chapter four. And so on your worksheet, I have listed them in a big box. And so these are some of the ones that you see. Um, the first that I wanna make sure that we just uh, pay attention to are the reciprocal identities. And so reciprocal means when you reverse the numerator and the denominator, or it's one over something. Um, so we know that the cosecant of x is equal to one over the sine of x. This isn't new to us. We've been using this fundamental identity for a while. That the secant of x is one over cosine and that the cotangent of x is one over tangent. Now this is stipulated that this is wherever these functions are defined, you can use these. Okay. Um, what is not listed specifically with these, but that we also use in this section, is that um, the sine of x is one over the cosecant of x. This is also almost given with this, and we can use that as well. That the cosine of x is one over the secant of x, and that the tangent of x is one over the cotangent of x. Those are not specifically listed, but they're also understood to be um, identities that we are allowed to use. So that's um, one thing I want to point out. Uh, the negatives, these are the negative um, identities, and it's that if we take the sine of negative x, that's equal to negative sine x. Um, and this is whenever a function, any kind of function, if you take in college algebra, hopefully you saw this, um, that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. If that is true, then you're looking at, uh, at an odd function. And this um, reflects across the origin. So you may or may not be familiar with this, but I'm just going to, just in case you are, and it helps you, I'm telling you this. It reflects across the origin, the graph. The graph reflects across the origin. Now what this means, the origin, what that means is that this, this is an example of a graph that reflects across the origin. Do you see this is x cubed and it is an odd function. If you were to reflect this part of the graph down um, across the x and then across the y, it ends up in the same place. So typically, um, graphs that are odd in nature are going to either fall in the first in the third quadrant or the second in the fourth. Just so you can see how this works with um, the sine wave. This is what a sine wave looks like. This is one sine wave, right? And if um, this is, if we took the other pe one period back, you could see that if we reflected this across the x, then this is what we'd have. And then if we took this dash part and reflected across the y, then this is gonna land right here on the purple. And this over here is gonna land right here on the purple. And this part's gonna fall here, and this part's gonna fall here, and it will exactly end up in the original spot. That is what this is saying algebraically, and this graph, in fact, does this um, with the reflections. Also, tangent will be the in, in the same category. Um, tangent of negative x is equal to negative tangent x, and so let's just see if we can think about this. Tangent, um, according to the quotient rule, quotient properties, which I forgot to write up here, but it's on your sheet. Tangent is the sine of x divided by the cosine of x. Well, what if we take the tangent of negative x? Well, that's gonna be the sine of negative x over the cosine of negative x. And we just see right here that the sine of negative x is really not negative sine of x. Negative sine of x, okay. We haven't dealt with the cosine of negative x. This is a new property that tells us that. The cosine of negative x is cosine of x. Well, what does the cosine wave look like and what does that mean? What happens when functions do that? Well, when functions do that, right here, where we said if f of negative x is equal to negative f of x, it's an odd function. If f of negative x equals to f of x, not the negative of it, that is called an even function. And this graph reflects across, not the origin, but across the y axis. So here's a graph that does that. X squared. When you look at it, it looks the same on both sides of the axis. That's an even function. That's what it looks like. 
So what does cosine look like? Okay, let's see. Cosine, we're saying is an even function. It looks like this. It starts high, goes low, goes high. And on this side, it would go like this. And if you look across the y-axis, it looks the same on both sides. This is an even function. And this algebraically is what it's saying. So if we go back down here, the tangent of negative x is equal to the sine of negative x over the cosine of negative x. But we just learned that the sine of negative x is equal to negative sine of x. And the cosine of negative x is equal to regular cosine of x because it's an even function. Then this is a negative times a sine over a cosine or just simply negative tangent of x. So we sort of just proved this last property right there. Okay, there are some quotient um, properties or identities that I didn't write down. So it shouldn't be shocking to you because we have used those before. The tangent of x is the sine of x over the cosine of x. And then the cotangent of x is the cosine of x over the sine of x. Okay, these are also properties. Then the last ones that we see are Pythagorean identities. Okay, these identities are a big deal and we need to uh, get used to them. I only wrote one on the board. There's three on your sheet. I'm going to show you how to come up with the other two without really memorizing them. I tend to memorize this one. Sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x is 1. So this is a good moment for me to make sure you understand what this notation means. This right here is the same thing as sine of x squared plus the cosine of x squared is 1. Except for we typically write it like this. So these mean the same thing. Okay. Um, just for notation's sake, I wanted to show you that. So if I have this... Okay. Let's see how we can come up with, with the other two Pythagorean identities. And so this is how you can do it. You can take this first one and you can divide the whole, both sides of the equation by um, sine squared of x. Let's do that. Let's go through and let's divide both sides of this by sine squared of x. All right. Well, sine squared of x divided by sine squared of x is a 1. And cosine divided by sine is cotangent. So cosine squared divided by sine squared is cotangent squared. Cotangent squared of x. And 1 over sine is cosecant. So 1 over sine squared is cosecant squared. This is the second Pythagorean identity that we use. Um, the third one, I don't typically memorize. I will just do the same thing I just got through doing, only instead of going through and dividing both sides of this first equation by sine squared, I go through and I divide by cosine squared. And it goes like this. Sine divided by cosine is tangent. So sine squared divided by cosine squared is tangent squared. So that's what we get right here. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is 1, and 1 over cosine is secant. So 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. 1 over is secant squared. So these are all three Pythagorean identities. Now, what we will sometimes do, just like up here where I said, if we know that cosine of x is 1 over sine x, then sometimes we use this one, that sine x is 1 over cosecant x. Um, we do the same thing with these identities. Do you see the first one, sine squared x plus cosine squared of x is 1? Um, this is an identity, but also with that, we just go ahead and say, hey, this one we will use a lot too. It's just a little algebraic manipulation of that. So we might say, if you see this, 1 minus cosine squared of x. If we subtract cosine squared of, from both sides, we get sine squared of x, we might use that one as well. Or if we have 1 minus sine squared of x, if we do that, one or 1 minus sine squared of x is equal to cosine squared of x. These are other um, identities we might use. So these are the fundamental identities. We will be using these a lot in 4.1 and 4.2 and for the rest of kind of our trig, whenever we use trig, we're going to use these a lot. We already have used a lot of these. 
Um, so now let me make sure you know what an identity is now that I've been talking about these identities. What's an identity? So on your sheet, I have a blank, some blanks for you to fill in. And it says a blank is a blank in one or more variables if the left side is a blank to the right side, oh, to the blank blank for blank replacements of all the variables for which both sides are blank. There's a lot of blanks. Okay, so this is what is an identity. So let's look at this guy. So let me make some room. And so, um, and so that I don't have to write this whole thing out, I've typed it out so that it would be nice for you to see. I'll tell you what goes in the blank. So what is an identity? It says an identity is what goes in the first blank. The first blank is an identity is an equation. An identity is an equation in one or more variables if the less if the left side is da, 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 left side is blank to the da, da, for Replacements of the variables for which both sides are, are, okay, what goes in the blanks? It goes like this. An identity is an equation. So, an identity, identity is an equation. So, that means what's an equation? It has an equal sign in it. It has two sides to it. It's not just an expression. An expression is just some, some math expression, but no equal sign, no two sides. An equation has two sides. Um, and then it says in one or more variables, so it can have just an X, or it can have an X and a Y, or an X and a Y and a Z, or A, B, C. It can have one variable or more variables. Um, if the left side is equal to, this one is equal, to the blank blank, this is going to be the right side. If the left side is equal to the right side, when? When will the left side be equal to the right side? For all uh, values. For all values. All the time, the left side is equivalent to the right side. As long as these values are defined, um, keep the expressions defined. So, as long as they are kind of in the domain of each of the expressions, then um, it's true. So it means, what is an identity? It's an equation where the left side and the right side will be true no matter what value you put in for the um, um, variables. As long as the values that you're putting in don't cause division by zero or don't cause you to um, get kicked into the imaginary number domain. So that's, that's what it is. So here's just an example of an identity. All right, it might be something like, um, let's do this one. What if we had, uh, let's do this, three, two X plus seven is equal to six X plus 21. All right, three times two X plus seven is equal to six X plus 21. Um, can we make the, this side look like that side? We can distribute the three. Okay, so this is going to be an identity because no matter what value of x we put in, the left side is going to equal to the right side. So let's try it. Let's try x is 0. What's going to happen? Well, for this one, 6 times 0 is 0 plus 21. 6 times 0 is 0 plus 21. Oh, we get a true statement. Okay, let's try x is negative 2. All right. 6 times negative 2 is negative 12 plus 21, okay. And then on the right side, we get 6 times negative 2, negative 12 plus 21, and that's going to give us, what, 9? And so we get a true statement, 9 equals 9. I think you can see it doesn't matter what value we put in for x, a fraction, a whole number, a decimal, the left side is going to equal to the right side because they're the same exact thing. Okay, this is an identity. We have dealt with other equations that can be solved. Um, these are called conditional statements. 
conditional. All right, what's a conditional statement? It's not an identity. Identity is true all the time. What is conditional? Maybe if we had three times two X plus seven is equal to 30. Let's do that. Okay, let's distribute the three. Six X plus three times seven is 21 is 30. Let's subtract 21 from both sides and we get 6x is equal to 9. Divide both sides by 6. x is 9 over 6 or 3 over 2 if I simplify that, right? Okay, okay. So we got a solution. This statement is conditional, meaning it is true on the condition that x equals to 3 halves. This one is true all the time, any time for any value of x that you put in, uh, because as long as it's not causing division by zero, because this is identity. This is what this is called. This is only true when x is 3 halves. If, if I have x is 5, it will not be true. Let's try that. x is 5. Well, when x is 5, what do we get here? 2 times 5 is 10, plus 7 is 17. 17 times 3. Does this equal to 30? Let's see. 17 times 3 is 21, 3, 4, 5. Does 51 equal to 30? No. So it's not true for any value of x. This is when we let x equal to 5. It's only true when x is 3 halves. It's conditional. So what we're dealing with are not conditional statements. We're dealing with identities for the next two sections in this trig chapter. So how can you disprove that something is an identity? You do have some homework, and I may well ask you to say, show me that this is not an identity. How do you do that? You just simply have to find one value that you can stick in for the variable that for which it's not uh, causing division by zero, any number that's not causing division by zero, and show that the, both the sides are not equal, just like I did with five. So here's a for instance. Let's show, let's show that, oh, so that's how I, the next blank. How to show that a statement is not an identity? Find one value for which both sides are defined is what goes in that blank, but not equal is what goes in the second blank. So let's proceed. Let's do these examples. We've got three examples the with some little subparts. Uh, the first one, use the fundamental identities to find the exact values of the remaining trig functions of x given that, and they give us some conditions. Now, this first example is stuff that you guys have already been doing. This is not new stuff. But now we're going to officially use these identities, and, and we're going to be really, really good at it now. So, number one, we gotta use, we're going to use the fundamental identities, and you have that on the sheet, to um, come up with all six. So, these are the conditions for the first one. It says that... Um, the cosine of some angle x is equal to the square root of 7 over 4. So this is one part A. The cosine of x is the square root of 7 divided by 4. And it tells us that the cotangent of x is equal to negative the square root of 7 divided by 3. Okay, so... Um, what is very helpful to do this is I recommend um, officially using the fundamental trig identities. We could do this through pure algebra and using those identities. But I am always going to be okay if you guys draw a triangle. So what is, let's think about the quadrants, okay? The cosine is positive. Cosine of x is positive. The cotangent is negative, okay? Let's use an identity to think about the what is the tangent? Well, the tangent of x is 1 over the cotangent. So this is going to be negative 3 over the square root of 7. Okay, that's good. And the tangent is negative, right? And the tangent is negative. Okay, here is our quadrants. Which quadrant are we in if the cosine is positive? Oh, either 1 or 4, right? We're on this side. But the tangent is negative. Where's the tangent negative? That's where we're dividing a positive and a negative. That's going to be quadrant four. So we're in, this is important, really critical, to establish which quadrant we're in. So we're down here in quadrant four. So draw a triangle up against the x-axis. On your test, I saw people drawing it different ways, but it needs to be, the right angle needs to be formed up against the x-axis. 
and this is our angle in quadrant four. And then we can just label the information and use Pythagorean theorem. The cosine of x is adjacent, square root of seven, over hypotenuse, four. Here's another thing. The, um, the hypotenuse is never negative. I saw some people put negatives there. It's never negative. If a negative is gonna show up, it's gonna be here or here. But since it's in quadrant four, this is gonna be positive. This is negative, because it's down in quadrant four. So uh, we, got, we can use the Pythagorean theorem, or look here, we could just use this. The tangent is negative three over square root of seven. All right, well, tangent of x is opposite three over adjacent square root of seven, but there's a negative. Which one of these is negative? We're in quadrant four, so it's here. So with that information, we can go ahead and, and tick these off. We have the cotangent, we have the tangent. How about the sine? How about the, the, co, the cosecant? How about the cosine? Oh, we have that one. Well, what's the secant? Just using the reciprocal, secant is four over square root of seven. Okay, let's use our triangle for the sine. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, negative three over four. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine negative four over three. So let me just check my work because on video sometimes um, when you're explaining stuff, you are not paying as much attention to if you're making mistakes. So let me see if I'm happy with my answers here. And I did it on this side and I said that cosine, cotangent, tangent, sine, cosecant, and secant. Yep, this is all right. Let's do B. B says, and I changed this one up from the original, so I make sure I write down the right thing, that they give us this information that the cosine of x is negative four over seven, and that the tangent is less than zero. These are the two conditions. Well, what this is telling us is that the cosine is negative. The cosine is negative. And that the tangent is also negative. Oh, what quadrant are we in if the cosine is negative and the tangent is also negative? Well, the cosine is negative in quadrant two or quadrant four. We're over here. All right. Where's the tangent negative? Well, the tangent is positive in quadrant three. What did I say, two or four? Two or three is what I meant to say, sorry. Two or three. So, um, is where the cosine is negative. So, if the tangent is negative, is it two or three? Well, in quadrant three, the tangent is a negative divided by a negative, which makes it positive. So, we're not in quadrant three, we're up here in quadrant two. So, this is where we are. Draw yourself a triangle up against the x-axis. Here's x. Okay, let's start labeling what we can. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's adjacent over hypotenuse. Why did I choose to make the four negative? Because it wasn't the hypotenuse, that's why. Plus it's in quadrant two where it is negative. So now let's do Pythagorean theorem. We could say uh, negative four squared plus, we'll call that b for now, plus b squared is equal to seven squared. So we get 16 plus b squared is 49. So we get b squared is 49 minus 16 is a 33. So B is the square root of 33. So the question is, should we make it positive or negative? But positive is the answer because quadrant two, it's, it's in the positive section, it's up high. Okay, so that is our triangle. We can spit out all of these answers. There's cosine, let's do secant. Reciprocal, negative seven over four. Let's do tangent, okay, opposite over um, adjacent, negative square root of three, 33 over four. Let's do cotangent. Reciprocal, negative four over square root of 33. Let's do sine, opposite over hypotenuse. And then cosecant is flip-flop, the reciprocal seven over the square root of 33. Now, let me check my work. So, just a second. Make sure 
sure I'm happy with all this. I said this, 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 this. I said that. 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 I'm okay with that. Okay, so that's number one. Now, let's see. What else have we got? Part two and part three. I'm just going to pause the video and start a new one because this is getting really long. So if you want to take a break, come back.